Welcome to the Intangibles Podcast, presented by PZM, the home for basketball content. Right. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time you're watching this. Welcome back to the Intangibles Podcast. I'm Matt. I'm Sam. And uh, today, we have a very, very, very special guest with us. Something different than usual. Yeah. Finally, we have someone that's not related to Ateneo in any way, but Still, we consider one of the best players that has ever stepped foot in the Philippines ever. Um, a multiple-time champion right here. We have uh, Jared Dillinger. Oh, uh, What's up, guys? The Thank devil. you, guys. Thank you for having me. That was a gracious introduction. Um, okay. Please don't call me the best ever again. Please. <laughs> That's cringy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hey, I'm a good player. I'll take that. I could I can hoop. We'll leave it as that though, man. I'll leave it as that. Thank you. <laughs> oh, we, we have a humble Jared Dillinger with us today. Um today we're gonna find out a few few information about him, about his basketball life back from uh when he was a kid until now. And sure. uh let's see where we go from there. So um sure. We are, um can you just t- give us like a quick background story how did your basketball career start Sure <clears throat> Okay so like most kids I had a hard time sitting still and I played man I played like seven sports at a time um my parents were amazing my dad was amazing he involved me in as many sports as possible. So I was one of those kids where I'm playing soccer, American football, track and field, baseball, basketball, um, BMX racing. Uh, yeah, bro. I snowboarding. I was in all of those, like as like competition sports and, um, The older and older I got, as I got into high school, I kept, I was dropping one sport off just because you just, it's not sustainable, to be honest, to play all those sports. Um, And at the time it was ninth grade, I dropped football and baseball and decided to just go full on basketball mode. It, It was clearly, it was just the most fun. It was the most back and forth. Baseball could kind of be boring. Football, I was getting lit up on the field. I was like, I was so skinny in high school. So playing, imagine playing American football. Man, I look like, I can't explain who I look like, man. I look like, uh, who, who's that dude? Who's that dude from, um, uh, I just watched that podcast of him just, just recently. He played for Lehigh and he scorched Duke. For like thirty points, um, dude. He plays for New Orleans now, and and the name room? No, no, he's from Duke. Uh, he was... Who? No, no, he's from Lehigh. So he used to play. He used to play in tandem with Dame Lillard before he got traded to New Orleans. What's his name? C.J. McCollum. Oh, Gosh, no. dang it, bro! Oh. I look just like I looked just like C.J. McCollum when he was in college. Like the skinniest, skinniest dude ever. So I, I had to stop playing football. I was way too thin. Um, So from there, yeah, focused all on basketball. And then Bola eventually made it to a couple colleges and then got recruited to the Philippines. I blinked two times and now I've been playing pro for 15 years. It goes by fast. Yeah, dude, Very dude. fast. By the way, do you have any other hobbies aside from basketball? Well, of, of, like we know right that, now we know the NFTs, but like the other hobbies. Sure, I'm gamer. I'm a gamer, bro. I've always I've always has been. Um, like I know I'm into esports and I'm playing Mobile Legends, yeah. and uh, <laughs> it's cool, bro. Yeah, it's cool. I'm not that good at it, obviously. Like, there's a lot of terminology I still need to learn. Um, but I just play any and all games, like. I got a Switch, uh, Xbox, a PS5, mm-hmm. a PC. I play everything, bro. Everything from like GTA to Call of Duty to Hogwarts Legacy to Roadblocks. Yeah, and I want to try that. 
Bro, I play all of them. Hogwarts. Like I'm full on gamer, bro. Like my my origin story into gaming was like Final Fantasy VII back in the day. Mm. And that that game was so dope. For for the kids who don't know, Final Fantasy VII, that's like it's a good game. One of the best best RPG games. That's that's an OG saying it though. Uh -huh. Um do you so have I'm, I'm a gamer. Do you have a top Okay, cuz we we usually ask top five random uh random stuff here like mm -hmm. as, as just a segment sure. so do you yeah. have any top five uh video games for us your top five okay, do, uh, okay. let's do console let's do console or whichever you play more your pc gamer sure. so game sure sure whatever sure 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 um okay so golden eye nintendo 64, 64. right final fantasy 7 <laughs> ps1 Ooh. um and I'm going way back, bro. Oh, that's, 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 <laughs> um, Metal Gear, Metal Gear Solid Gear. PS2. When the yeah. first Metal Gear Solid came out, that one was amazing, right? Mm -hmm. Um, what else was a really dope one? I would say, uh, absolutely one of the Call of Duties. I'm getting it wrong. It's, it's when they when we first started incorporating zombies when you. No, not Warzone. Before that, when we when they first started utilizing zombies, where you can play against zombies, dude, I don't know which one that was. Modern Warfare. Modern Warfare. First Modern Warfare. Cold War. Was it Cold War? I think so, bro. Yeah. I think it might have been Cold War. Yeah. Um, let let's just stop there. Those ones. Those are some. Those are pretty solid. Yeah. yeah. Solid ones right there. How about uh, I see I see is that spirit of the way you have behind right there. So oh yeah, yes it is. Bro. Yeah, yeah. I'm a big anime. Oh, so you big yep. anime fan too? I am. I am. Um, I grew yeah. up into it, watching it at like the babysitter's house when I was like a little kid. Like the the family ones, like my neighbor to Toro, Castle in the Sky type stuff. There, already set it in my head, and then I've been watching all that junk ever since I was a kid. All right. Um, a while ago you mentioned that uh. If basically you talk to us about your entire like a uh, brief line like brief timeline of your basketball career and you said mm -hmm. you were recruited here in the Philippines so can you talk to us sure. about the, the process yeah. of that how that happened uh, you know everything sure. sure now so you guys got to understand back then we didn't have smartphones yeah. YouTube it was definitely not what it was today internet it alone was not what it was today yep. so when I was in college at University of Hawaii, I couldn't just look up the PBA, let alone colleges. So Phil Ams, Phil Foreigners, we weren't going to college yet into the Philippines. Um, it just wasn't a thing yet. So I started playing really well at university and Philippine scouts started coming to my game from the Philippines, um, from both companies, from the San Miguel side and from the MVP side. And I didn't know the rivalry. I didn't know who was who. I didn't know anyone. I, I just, they all were just Filipinos to me. I didn't know who's the who. Um, so Coach Chot was the national team coach at the time. He's the one who gave me the best offer. He'll, he said, hey, man, put you on talking text right away. We're, the, we're this type of team, yada, yada, yada. And dude, you're good enough to be on the national team right away. So you come with me, put you on the national team. I'll get you with a talking text. Here's some newspaper clippings of Jimmy and Harvey. Like that's all he could show me. It was newspaper clippings. So, um, yeah, it, it sounded cool. And I was a little, I had my reservations because from a kid standpoint, mind you, I'm in my twenties. I can't look up anything about the PBA. There's just nothing to look up. All I find is looking on CNN that there's some, terrorism going on in Mindanao you know like that's the only <laughs> thing I could Man. Yeah, that shit's scary yeah I know right bro that that's all they would show so I had my reservations but when I got to the Philippines and I saw how basketball was a religion basically out yes. here I was like whoa <laughs> hey yo this is hey this is, this is crazy um you know fast forward 
playing through my my amateur games that you have to do for a requirement and I'm at the PBA draft that I really found out like this is real like wow like we got commentators breaking down the the draft picks and you know people are excited to see who's who getting drafted um from that point on I, I just knew like man all right this is gonna be a lot of fun we're gonna have some fun here <laughs> All right. Um, speaking about the draft, that draft class was stacked. I think you have Gabe, you have Gabe yeah. Norwood, you have Jason Castro, and you have, um, personally the favorite, the favorite person that I'd like to see you go against Sol Mercado. So, oh, so, <laughs> so, what were you? What were your expectations during that draft? And what was it like? Right. What was it like here um, in your world? Oh, uh, right, right, right. So I came in so quick, so fast. People didn't know who I was right away. Um, you know, Gabe, Saul, the other Phil M's, they were already playing in these D-League dra- D League games for like over a year, almost a year and a half. Everyone knew who they were. Mm-hmm. I came onto the scene. I was there for not even two months before I got drafted. And MVP pulled all the strings to make sure I was going to get drafted by talking text imagine in 60 days i played 30 games to get my requirements in before the pba draft just just think about that <laughs> i was playing basically a game every two days more more or less yeah. right just to get in my requirements and that that was like a circus like imagine i had my whole team playing with me just so that i could get my games in so i can make it to the draft So everyone's finding out, like, who is this guy? Like, how does he just get to come in two months, just gets to go to the draft? I had some haters. I'm not going to lie. Like, I had some haters that I just got this easy path to go into the league. Um, So Saul and Gabe, even though we're all Philams, um, yeah, we had some healthy competition against each other, for sure. They were, in the beginning, they were comparing me and Gabe because we had the same body structure. Right. Um, and then Saul had that aggression. Saul just Saul will wear his emotion on his sleeve. So we all wanted to go at each other. Um, and that was just the nature of it. And at least how we carried our energy from the States, we were we were close. We were homies off the court. We tried to kill each other though on the court because we wanted the we wanted yeah. the big contract and we wanted the fame and the glory. As soon as we got off the court, yeah, we were homies and we were, we were giving each other shit like, oh, I blocked you, bro. I, I pinned that shit against the wall or, oh, you, you, yeah, you got me good. Oh, you killed, you know, like it was just, it's just a code that, that you kind of go by. You know what I'm saying? Like, this just, that's just how it was. That's how it yeah. was. So we never had any bad blood. We were just, we were just very competitive. That's, that's how we took it. Well, speaking of the competitiveness that you guys had in that draft class, I, I mean, I don't want to, I don't want it coming from my mouth, but like, I, I, I watched that that podcast with with that you had with Mikey Reyes before about oh, okay. about yeah, yeah. you being hidden by talking text. Yeah. Is that how? Can you talk us through that so we can have that conversation with you now? Yeah, yeah. Um, it was really basic. Um, they I wouldn't start in any of the, the my games, my amateur games, and then they would always tell me like, JD, just don't do too much, okay? <laughs> don't do too much out there to get people excited, and and you know when you're a kid, you always want to prove yourself, and you always have so much, I hate to say it, ego and pride, you know. So every now and then. I'll show a little flash or I'll catch it open, throw it, throw it in, or thank you, Arthur Mercy. Um, I'll do a little bit. And then the coach, coach, uh, coach Eric, he passed away, by the way, uh, a couple years back. He would kind of look at me like, like, hey, man, chill out. I'm going to take you out right away. <laughs> or our bosses are going to get mad at me. <laughs> um so every now and then I, I didn't, I was fine, bro. So I just kind of laid low, didn't do too much, had fun with my team um, while getting those games in. And, and that, that was really it really just, 
it wasn't too, too strict of, they weren't that mad at me if I was going off. Um, but yeah, it was just lay low. Don't, don't show anyone anything until I get to the league. How different would you think how it would have been if, if like you were drafted number one? I don't know, man. Like Somehow. I tell you what, like it would have been fun. It yeah. would have been fun. Like at least working a better contract, like, Back then, no matter what, you had to pay your dues and work your way up to get a good contract. Mm -hmm. You know, like it wasn't until like Stanley Pringle came in and kind of changed all that. Stanley Pringle was the first Phil to come in to ask for a big, big money contract. And he changed everything. Before then, we all we would get the PBA max. And, you know, of course, can't really say, but. Some people would get under the table if you got your PBA max, if that's okay. Um, I can neither confirm or deny that happens. I'm just talking quite <laughs> yep. with you guys. Yep, yep, um, yep. For sure. But uh but that's it. That's it, bro. And it was always from from the manager standpoint, hey, this is how much we can give you for now. Just keep working. And win us the championship or whatever they would say, and then we'll give you the big money later. That that is just there's no way around it. That's just how they they packaged it towards rookies. Well, speaking of being a rookie, can you do you have actually of course you do, but can you tell us about your welcome to the PBA moment? Oh sure. We play we were playing against Coca-Cola. They had uh John Arrigo, Nick Belasco, Nick Belasco. <laughs> Ali Peak. I, no, 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 no. Sorry, not Ali Peak. Asi Talaba. Uh, she... Um. Okay, and uh, I played well in my first game, but the welcome moment was just get, getting lit up on screens. Asi and Nick, and we're cool. We're in the same circle of Phil, Phil foreigners, so they had fun hitting me really hard. Like I was already on the national team with Asi, mm -hmm. and um, but they were just lighting me up. And, and like moving screen, sticking out their butt while trying to guard John Arrigo. And John was a talker. So he was he was talking all that noise into my ear. And I just it is what it is. I already knew how it was like, oh, I'm the young guy. All right. You're going to talk all this noise at me and hit me hard. I'll just act like I'll act like it don't affect me. And in fact, you guys can check this with Nick. My first game in. So Nick was messing with me. So to 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 get him off his game, I start I, I like grab I like grabbed his private area, like while trying to, get, trying to get a rebound. Uh-huh. Cause they were messing with me, bro. They were getting me. So I had to do something. So I, I got him. I got him a little bit. And, and I can't remember what he said. Like, all right. He's like, all right, young fella, I see, I see what you're trying to do. I I like it. Like <laughs> I gotta check what he said though, bro, to to get to get my facts straight. But it caught him off guard where he was just like, damn, bro, you don't you don't give a you don't give a F, do you? You're crazy, bro. <laughs> uh that was a long time ago though, bro. <laughs> so obviously I don't do that junk anymore. That was that was like PBA back then was crazy, bro. Yeah, yeah. Um, what was it like? Uh I mean, what aspect of Philippine basketball um shocked you the most was it the physicality of the players yes. or the physicality fan? physicality easily like back in the states we would just talk noise to each other a lot just yapping back and forth yep. going at it here you don't talk you don't be talking to each other it's more like i'm gonna hit you really hard the next play down with my elbow but i'm not gonna say anything right it's like non-confrontational passive aggressive type physicality <laughs> and that so we had to get i had to get used to that um i i was used to talking noise all the time like my rookie year i would be talking way too much where i'd be talking back to my 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 teammates like i was imagine i was a rookie and i would talk back to players like mock mock cardona and <laughs> He would try to he would try to choke me out in, in <laughs> practice. 
just because just because I would be man. running my mouth and, and you know just challenging him as a rookie um I didn't get all that at the time of the the status thing I just wanted to win that that was really my energy yeah so yeah. I so I did have to learn you know like I had to be put in my place a couple times and guys like Jimmy Harvey Ali they were really good queers like they really helped me be a professional and tone down like when to pick and choose to yeah. <laughs> to run your mouth yeah. um it was really helping me out a lot with that type of stuff we know that you have the best one of the best nicknames or monikers in the pba or like basketball so when did you become the daredevil and who gave you that nickname Man, I got it my first. I got it my first year, right away. Like my first, my my rookie year, I got it right away because I was playing so reckless. Um, I would go to the basket so hard, bro. Um, people forget like my first two years, I was dunking on all the big men. I I was dunking on Mink, Aussie. Uh, on the national team, I threw one down over a seven footer in in China against China. Um, I didn't care. I was just trying to challenge anyone. I, I just, I just thought I was invincible. Um, so that, that name stuck quick and, and just, it just kind of flow, went flow. It flowed with my name. Right. Yeah. Um, so right off the bat, it was, it was pretty lucky because you don't, not many players get nicknames and like, after my career is unfolded, it's not like I'm some MVP all star. I don't, I've been to the all star game like three times. So, um, to get a nickname given my type of career, like I'm, dude, I'm really grateful. Like for sure, I'm grateful. Is that, is that nickname still <laughs> up to this day? No, I'm like the Dare Angel now. Dare Angel. I'll shoot, <laughs> I'll shoot threes and fadeaways, bro. Like, <laughs> I can't, but I'll dunk it a cut sometimes in practice just to get the young guys fired up. But uh, it, it, I, I'm not anymore. there anymore, bro. I am, <laughs> I am fully aware of who I am. <laughs> Say what? Oh yeah, I mean, yeah you guys I'd like to ask, cause you went, you were a superstar in Meralco. For me personally, that's where I saw your, uh, that's where I saw your game unfold. Yeah, me. And if I'm not mistaken. That lineup was you, um, Cliff Hodge, um, mm -hmm. Sunday, see oh, wow. Rito Hognatan, and It'd I think like Gary DeVitt, Gary yeah, DeVitt, and Mike DeVid. Cortez. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> cool cat. Yep. And then so often, did you guys have Alan Durham in your team already at that time? We have who? Alan Durham. Nope. No, nope. um, we had Alan Durham when we had Newsom. When uh, Newsom was like young Newsom, like rookie, rookie time, rookie years, Newsom. All right. So I just talk about talk about that team because that team was super competitive. Sure. Yeah, well, we got lucky, man. People forget Jimmy came out of retirement. And uh <laughs> I wouldn't say I tampered uh him to come <laughs> over to Morocco, but I I I would like to think I helped a little bit to get him to come over to Morocco. Um, that changed the dynamics of our team when we got him there in terms of leadership. Like before then I was the leader of the team, which I tried my hardest just to copy what Jimmy does because I was around Jimmy my whole career. So when Morocco made me a captain, I, I called Jimmy right away. Like, hey man, I, I didn't even want this title, but the team, the coaches made me a captain. I'm going to be calling you every week, bro, because <laughs> this is my first time leading a team and I want to do it the right way. Obviously, I'll, I'll, I'm not you, but I need some help. <laughs> um, So uh, Jimmy was kind of helping me with that until he came over. As soon as he came over, man, he got us organized. He got us together, hanging out, um, working. He grabbed all the guards like Newsom and Becerra Mare to work out with him every morning before practice. Like that's the type of dude he was. Um, 
so with Jimmy's leadership and our young guns like Newsom and Basser still playing and learning as they're going, and then we had Durham, like we were all right, man. Um, we were all right. We were not bad at all. So uh, that whole that whole couple years of going to the finals against Hanebra, that shit was fun. It was really fun. Speaking of that, because that, that was our next question. Um, what is it like that transition that you made? Because that was a bit of a rivalry, Miralco and Hanebra oh. for a time, and then yeah, we we were hard. kind of surprised that you know you you got sure. you got stand. I was surprised myself. Yeah, yeah like got... first of all, first of all, it's a business. Like people people don't understand how much of a business it it really is. Right. And my initial my initial intention was to go to San Miguel Beerman. It Ooh, wasn't until that was my oh. yeah. It was over been. with San Miguel. Jimmy was with San Miguel for a little bit. So when I hit I hit up Jimmy, let him know what's going on on, on my side in my situation. And he was just like, yo, I'm gonna make a couple calls. We're gonna have you on San Miguel, bro. So I thought it was a done deal. I came into the office at, at San Miguel to talk to boss Al Francis Chua. And we're just kind of going back and forth, talking about the team. And he gets off the phone with RSA and he's just like, no, nah, man, looks like you're on Hanebra. Coach Cohn really wanted you. Um, you're on Hanebra now. And I was happy, <laughs> of course, but I just knew like, ah, oh, I got to deal with this. Oh, man. Okay. All right, I'm gonna have to deal with this crowd and and damage control type of thing. And the worst part of all of it was that I was injured, yeah. so I had to just sit there with my mouth closed. Like it's not funny. Like it's it's not funny to be like in this little situation with the team, and I can't even play to show them that hey, I'm with you guys. I'm with y'all. Let's go. I couldn't do that. I had to sit there and. I, I didn't want to treat it as a joke. I knew that every game, the camera was going to be on my face to see any type of reaction. So I was just stone cold, just not making any any type of movements that would just, I don't want to disrespect anyone. You know, like Morocco, MVP, they were pissed the way I went about it. They were so angry. So, and, and in my head, like, hey, it's a business, man. Just, it is what it is. And um, I didn't want to respect them. And I didn't want to disrespect, you know, Hanebra. I wanted to get healed as soon as possible so I could help. Um, that was, a, I'm not going to lie, that it was a very tough time mentally for me to act like everything is fine. But on the inside, I was, I was struggling. No doubt about it, man. I was struggling. I wanted to be on the court so bad. But anytime I did anything to get, or to speed up the process, just, you know, knees swelled up, something was hurting. It was very, very hard. But, but uh, man, Coach Cohn and the players management, they were so cool with me. They were so cool with me to see me get healthy, man. Like, I think that's why I, I bring, I try to bring so much value to them, whether it's on or off the court, just because, like, the minute I was with Hanebra, or San Miguel, they've shown me nothing but love and respect this whole time. So um just hats off to them, man, because they're cool as they're cool as hell for sure. Yeah. So was there anyone specifically that helped you get through that? Like you talked about your relationship with uh, Jimmy, and it se seems like that Jimmy's really um the guy that you look up to. So who else yeah. aside from him, of course. Yeah, it was always Jim, to be honest. I, I have a very small circle of friends. Um, I don't have a lot of friends. I'm cool with everyone. Like, everyone knows me as JD. Like, I'm cool with everyone. I'm good vibes. But, like, my actual homies, homies, it's really small. So, aside from Jim, there's a couple others that I would talk to to, to help kind of navigate through that. Um, But that was it, man. Like you just need to, you need some good friends and family. Talk about vent your experiences, your emotions, and they can kind of get you central, centralized back on the on the right track. 
but uh psh, it was hard i mean getting through stuff like that like i've gotten through so many crazy things i've gotten through a crazy car accident where the doctor said i was i wasn't supposed to walk anymore I was on a dynasty talking text team i'm on the national team i get in a car accident and now i can't walk so yeah, I got I boom, I get through that. I'm still I came back like looking like <laughs> uh pool, just like jacked up from top to bottom. You know, like I was jacked when I came back. Um, so I always had to go over these like obstacles and hurdles. And every time I got through it, I just got mentally fortified and I got built stronger in the mind, you know. So um it, it really did just help me in in anything. Well, it it looks like all that weight for Hinebra, uh, to to play there, to to have all that struggle. It it, it looked like it would be worth it now that you yeah, now know, that see it now. Did pretty well. Yeah, it looks like you did huh? pretty well. It looks like you did it very like very did, well. Yeah. <laughs> all the I'm championship. I'm doing all right, man. I, I mean, I'm like I'm lucky. Yeah, I'm lucky, bro. I am very grateful to be on the squad. Like the dudes we have. It reminds me of talking text days in terms of talent. Mm -hmm. Like we got, I don't know, bro. We got like nine guys that could start on any team. And that's just subjective. No disrespect to the other teams. I'm biased. Obviously I'm biased. Mm -hmm. So you guys just take my opinion with, a, with a, a, a thread of salt. But our team is nasty. We agree. Yeah. You, you're telling we me agree. you got Stan? You got Stan Pringle coming off the bench? Like what? <laughs> <laughs> for real <laughs> like i can stop right there yeah it's not fair yeah it's not fair bro um but the cool one's cool man no one cares about stat no one cares about the glory like when you got guys like la and scotty leading the team and those are the two most most unselfish individuals it just it just trickle trickles down to the other guys huh. and that's what makes us special like we are very selfless as a team i think we're leading the league in assists and i don't think we're over 30 assists a game and no team has done that in I, we need to fact check this but no team has done this in over 30 years of what we're doing right now um averaging over 30 assists is, is fucking nuts i don't know for the basketball purists 30 assists average is insane people don't teams just don't do that shit so it just goes to show like what we're messing with with our squad right now yep i agree we agree i mean so our podcast is called intangibles right and you mentioned that you guys are selfless. Mm. and one of the things one of the people that's really known in your team are raymond aguilar and nard spin yep. so talk yep. about what they bring to the table as far as the intangibles Bro. Sure. They are a pro's pro. People don't talk about Nards enough because he does not change his energy, whether he plays one minute or 40. And I'm a very observant person. I've been on winning teams. I've been on bad teams. I can tell when your team is really happy for the others. That's really important for winning in culture. Like if you're developing a winning culture, you truly need to be happy for your teammates who are doing well. I promise. If And you can see it. You can see it on the bench doing games. If other guys aren't cheering for other guys or um, really caring about each other, right? Raymond and Nards, they're the epitome of that, let alone the whole team. Like, I've seen Nards not play in like two or three games straight just because that's coach's decision for whatever reason that may be. Nards did not change or blink twice of any negativity. He just stayed ready whenever his moment is. Same thing with Raymond. Like, I know Raymond doesn't play at all. And when he does, the crowd cheers. But he takes it serious, too. He's not laughing. I mean, I know he smiles, but he still goes 100 miles per hour when he's in that game. He treats it very serious. And he does the same thing in practice. Raymond Nards, they're one of the first guys to come in and practice every day. Facts. So they're before, literally, they're the first guys to come in every like day. Prince, uh, Prince Caperal was with, with you guys before, right? Yep, Prince was with us before too. Uh huh. 
Yeah. And you can see a theme of guys that Coach Cone selects. He selects high character people. That, that's really his makeup of wanting. If you want to be on Coach Cone's team for you younger players out there, he looks for high character, good people. That is a priority for him. If you're not a good person, he'll sniff it out. And maybe maybe you do make the team, but you won't last. He'll he'll just he'll eventually let you go if he finds out you're being a knucklehead. Um, so that's really one of his main priorities. So he the guys that we have, everyone's cool. Everyone's cool as hell. Well, um, we talked about your transition, of course, from that dynasty talk and text team, your uh, star mm-hmm. status in Meralco, your leader role type here in Ginebra. You have you have this illustrious career. You have a lot of um awards or accomplishments that you've already mm-hmm. accomplished. Um, what's next for for you? Obviously, you guys see that I'm in crypto and NFTs. Um, I'm slowly moving into that realm. I'm also I'm also doing a couple shows now. Like I have a CNN show that I'll be doing, co-hosting in about money, obviously, because I'm in crypto. I'm also doing a basketball podcast with some of my pros, with Joe DeVance and Solomon Mercado and Gabe Norwood. Yeah, we're basically uh, we're keeping it simple, bro. We're just using the same business model as all the smoke with Matt Barnes and Stephen Jackson. We're doing the same thing here, bro. We're gonna bring that same energy. Our insight, our perspective, our stories, obviously. I'm sure a lot of you guys just want to hear our stories of stuff yep. that we've done. And that's that's really it, man. Um, Hanebra, I'll probably retire uh, within the next year. And I, I know that they want me to be a coach, and I do want to be a coach. But right now, my school is crazy. Um, so I'm, I'm sure I'll get back into it eventually. It depends, but um, I I would not be surprised seeing myself as an assistant coach with Hinebra at some point. All right. So with that, I feel like we should wrap it up. I mean, we don't want to take a lot of your time anymore, and no. uh, of course, we have we have stuff to do. But before we end the podcast, yeah, class. yeah we have class. Uh, we have class. <laughs> and um, before we end the podcast, though, um, can we just get some advice from you to the future hoopers sure. out there who want to sure. um, pursue the same career as you did? And sure. after that, can you nominate a guest that we can possibly oh, yes. guest after you? Uh, okay, you guys are just like the, the podcast in the States who do that. Okay, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sure. I got you, bro. Yeah. I got you. Okay, so advice, man. Just understand, ballers, hoopers out there, you're going to go through a lot of challenges, man. A lot of failure. Like, welcome and embrace the pain, suffering, and failure. Embrace it. Embrace it. Because that type of stuff that you're going to go through is just going to fortify and strengthen your mind and body. So you want to... F- you literally, you want to fail as much as you can. And the quicker that you can pivot and process your failures to not make the same mistake again, you'll be exponentially better and you'll learn faster or you'll grow or you'll get better. Like you have to take risks. You have to, again, I'm going to say it over and over. You have to fail. You have to embrace again pain suffering defeat with so the more you can like acknowledge it and take it without breaking your mind bro you're gonna you'll be a beast okay and uh shoot anyone that i would want to bring on i would say rico milehofer go get that guy because that guy his story to what he's done to what he's currently doing with pba motor club like He is cooler than he, he's a he's one of the coolest dudes you'll ever meet. And you should get him if you can. I know he's a busy dude, but try to get Rico. We'll try. We'll try. Um, well, we first first of all, we would like to thank you again for um 
accepting the invite. We love the conversation and uh, hopefully we get to talk to you again soon about anything basketball and uh, life in finance. Anything. Life, life, yeah, yeah, anything <laughs> possible. Uh, you guys want me to help you make money? <laughs> I, I, well, yep. Hey, we're not going <laughs> to deny that. I got you. I got you. Got you, Rose. That's that's all I'm doing these days. <laughs> yep, and um, hope hopefully you guys as well uh love the story that we Jared has told us, and um, hopefully we get more uh stories from him soon. Maybe I don't know, but uh, yeah, we'll look out for that. And uh, yeah, hope you guys enjoyed. Thank you again, Kuya Jared, and uh, Thank you. hope you guys stay safe. Okay. Um, thanks, buddy. God, thanks for the lovely interview. You guys are awesome. Now get your ass to class. <laughs> <laughs> so, so vibrant. We keep a low profiling.